thank, thank you. And uh, if I now, I will be able to um, have one more drink tonight than I would otherwise have had. So uh, that's my. I don't, and I don't think Mr. Jones would would begrudge me that. Um, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, I'd like to, I, so, so I'm talking about James Jones Patton and the question of cowardice. I would like to rename my talk, maybe instead of the question of coward, cowardice, the stubbornness of cowardice. Uh, I don't know how well my PowerPoint will work, and I will just abandon it if it doesn't work very well and not speak as well as Ms. Howe did, um, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll also try to get us out of here at a reasonable hour. Um, rather alarming, this list and probably a reflection of my perverse obsession with this idea of cowardice. Uh, I make all sorts of claims for it. I think it might be the worst thing you can say about somebody. We can talk about this over drinks later. Um, I, I, I have evidence for uh, all of these points. None of the evidence will I, will I bring to bear um, because I want to talk about Jones mostly and the Thin Red Line mostly. Um, but I'll make the claims and you, we can argue about them later. Uh, cowardice is of immense strategic importance. It occupies soldiers' minds more than any, more than worrying about being brave, for instance. Um, it's not self-limiting. Uh, it undoes courage, obviously. It can even be said to cause courage. Uh, James McPherson talked about this in his study of Civil War, uh, the motivation of Civil War soldiers, that soldiers wrote home worrying about cowardice. Um, they were preoccupied with it, and that is what gave them courage. Um, it manifests itself physically, uh, and this is one of the reasons it's so deeply ingrained in our psyche as a bad thing. It causes violence. It was not General Patton who said that where there is a choice between nonviolence and cowardice, I would choose violence. Um, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said that. Uh, perhaps the uh, grandest claim that cowardice helps structure morality and society. Um, can everybody hear me if I just talk like this? Because this picks up a little nervousness in my voice, which I don't want to hear, um, and nor do you. So, uh, so I have this, let's see if the, now how do I do the next thing? How do I get the next thing to go on the PowerPoint? Um, hey. Um, so at this point, you might be thinking that I'm one of the nine types of college teachers, maybe the steady droner, not the mighty famous big shot. Here I am the single theory to explain everything maniac, um, the nation that controls magnesium controls the universe. Okay? Advantage is easy to please. Um, I forget what it says down below. Maybe I'll tell you that later. Um, but there, there I am. I'm obsessed with cowardice. And I'm, I'm, apparently, I'm fairly, I am unique in this regard. Uh, nobody has written a book about cowardice. And this is where I come in. Um, there's a moment in Dante's Inferno at the beginning of Canto 3, and uh, Virgil's uh, just met Dante and, and about to bring him into hell, and he hears this noise, and he looks over, and he sees these people um, wailing, lamenting. They have maggots crawling on their feet. They're crying and bleeding. And he says, who are those guys? And Virgil says, those are the cowards. They, they, they didn't make a choice one way or the other. And um, they're not, certainly not good enough for heaven. And we don't want to let them into hell because the people who are in hell, who are bad enough for hell, will lord it over the cowards. But let's not talk about them. Let's just pass on. Okay? That's, that's all that's said about cowardice in Dante's Inferno, the greatest catalog of sin and human baseness that we have uh, in the Western tradition anyway. Um, fast forward to 1997. I'm working on my, on my book about cowardice, on my dissertation about cowardice. I am... Um, take a little, uh, divert myself by writing a review of a book by a man named William Ian Miller. Wonderful writer. He's a professor of law at Michigan. Uh, uh, seems to be a little <coughs> demented. He um, wrote a book called Humiliation, and then he wrote a book called The Anatomy of Disgust. And he, uh, and I sent him my review of The Anatomy of Disgust, and I said, what do you, what do, you do to, you know, top off humiliation and then disgust? And he said, oh, I'm writing a book about cowardice. And I, the um, graduate student, my, my, my heart fell. I thought, well, this guy's a you know, much more accomplished person. He's going to do a better job, and he's taking my topic. Um, three years later, he published a book in which, he's, in which on the first page he said, I was going to write a book about cowardice, but I found that I couldn't do it. 
cowardice gave way. That's what cowardice always does. So the field remained clear for me to um, pursue my megalomania. Um, let's see. Now, how does, this come, how does this relate to Jones and the Thin Red Line? This is, by the way, a, can, you, can any of you read that? All right, well, sorry. Um, I can read it if I stand close. So um, this is from an interview that uh, James Jones uh, in the, appeared in the Paris Review, 1958-59, while he was writing The Thin Red Line. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm at the moment trying to write a novel, a combat novel, which, in addition to being a work which tells the truth about warfare as I saw it, would free all these young men from the horseshit which has been ingrained in them by my generation. I don't think that combat has ever been written about truthfully. It, it has always been described in terms of bravery and cowardice. I won't even accept these words as terms of human reference anymore. And anyway, hell, they don't even apply to what, in actual fact, modern warfare has become. Um, and he, and I, uh, I would like to try to write about combat from outside this framework entirely. I say try because I have thus far, no, I have this fear of being thought a coward too. You see, myself. I don't know if I can actually be truthful to the spirit of what I actually felt. But I've made some strides in trying to understand myself, I think, and I think that in my life, I'm less afraid of being thought a coward than I used to be. And so what I, I'd like to argue, actually, is that, um, that what I want to talk about is that is, is Jones is grappling with this idea of cowardice, um, in the novel especially, um, in his own life a little bit, and also in, in, as a kind of foil, uh, we have General Patton, who famously dealt with this issue of cowardice in his own unique way. Um, a definition of cowardice uh, I draw from Aristotle and from the current uh, court's martial manual um, to give a working definition common to them both. A coward is someone who, out of excessive fear, fails to do his or her duty. Um, and the, what, to me, what, what Jones thought was that <coughs> modern war doubly vitiated cowardice. One, how can we talk about excessive fear given the immense power, range, nastiness of modern weaponry? Um, and how can we talk about duty, which implies choice, which implies some freedom of will when the powers of the modern state, um, of indoctrination, of, um, of the, the immense dynamics of, of the industrial warfare make choice meaningless. And, and we'll see how these play out in the thin red line. Um, so let, first I'll establish that, in fact, it's, it's everywhere in the novel. Um, with a, I mean, I, I could probably quote from 50 or 100 different places. Um, at the same time, somewhere in the back of each mind, like a fingernail picking uncontrollably at a scabby sore, was the small voice saying, but is it worth it? Is it really worth it to die, to be dead, just to prove to everybody you're not a coward? I think this was in the mind of, well, this was in the mind of, of many in Company C. Um, there are some soldiers we get to know better, such as Fife, who's very much preoccupied with cowardice. Um, Welsh talks about it, too. Um, now, so a question is, why after World War I, for instance, um, when we learned about shell shock and the um, terrible power of modern war, Military psychiatrists dealt with, with how this affected human beings in their way. Great novels were written to say, for instance, Hemingway said, what, what were words like honor and courage and glory? They don't mean anything. And we can flip that around and say, if courage doesn't mean anything, then um, neither does cowardice. Or Journey to the End of the Night, great novel by um, uh, Louis Ferdinand C Céline, he says, at least I wasn't one of the insane heroes. I had the sense to be cowardly. Okay? 